Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Product Core webinar. I see people are starting to trickle in. Um, I think it takes a second or two uh, when we officially start the broadcast for everyone to be um, inside, but we had over about 100 people register for this event tonight. So we're really excited um, to engage with a big uh, product community. Um, I'm going to introduce myself and kind of who Underscore is, and then I'll let the panelists um, intro themselves as well. Um, we're going to have, um, you know, some questions for the panelists, and we want to open it up as well uh, to a discussion because we want everyone to be able to engage um, together as well and make this as interactive as possible. Um, so I'm Jenny. I am the community manager at Underscore VC. Uh, we are a community-driven early-stage venture capital firm. Uh, we back founders from pre-seed to Series A, predominantly in software and infrastructure, um, with an emphasis really in building in Boston. Um, we recognize that capital is a commodity, so we really provide our founders what they need, which is a community of experts, um, such as the folks on this panel, um, which are huge experts in product and working remotely. Um, and we call our community our underscore core, and through the core, we're able to provide our uh, founders with the right expertise, with the right people at the right time. And that's all at zero cost to our founders. Um, so we often have events because people also in, in the core also want to get together and engage and learn from one another. Um, so we're excited to really have our first uh, product virtual uh, core event uh, spearheaded by Mina, who is our product fellow. Um, so really excited for you guys all to be here and hopefully continue to engage um, with Underscore. And I will let Mina take it from here. Thanks, Jenny. And uh, Underscore has been a huge help in setting all of this up. So shout out to Jenny and Devin and Sua and Christina for all their help. Um, so like Jenny mentioned, I am a Underscore fellow uh, for the product core. And really what that means is I am a product manager here in Boston um, at a digital health startup called Well. But I also spend a little bit of my week working with the awesome people at Underscore, helping build up the product community in Boston and outside of Boston as well. Um, so it's awesome to see familiar faces on this list of attendees of people who have been at other core events. We do things um, like you know, product office hours for our founders. We do these meetups. Um, we do happy hours for first PMs in the startup. So we try to just bring together that community as often as we can and uh, help them level up their skills so we can level up the community here in Boston. Um, I think this event is actually an awesome representation of what the product core and the community can do. So Ileana is a friend of mine uh, through Northeastern and through this product core. And maybe two, three weeks ago, as this all kind of started, and we were all making this transition to work from home. She texted me and she said, you know, it's, I feel like it's going to be really difficult to make a transition from doing product at Lola in person with my team to doing it remote. And I felt the same way. And we said, you know what, let's just like come together, get some people together, maybe 10, 20 people on a Zoom call. Um, and then we said, okay, let's just open it up. And, you know, we were able to go from maybe a small Zoom call to having some awesome speakers and panelists that I can't wait to hear from um, and a bunch of people attending as well. So Ileana, if you want to introduce yourself and then we can have the panelists introduce themselves as well. Yeah, hey everyone. I'm so glad you're all here today. This is awesome. I think definitely a huge representation of product in Boston and a really great way to bring the community together remotely for the first time. Um, like Mina mentioned, I'm Eliana. I'm a product manager at Lola, which is a startup in Boston. And I'd love for all the panelists to introduce themselves too. Yeah, Randir, if you want to get us started. Sure. I'm Randir Vieira. I'm a VP of product at Omada Health in San Francisco, California. I've been there since last year. Um, it is uh, all of our product folks are in San Francisco or based out of that office. Uh, we also have an office in Atlanta. Uh, we have a digital coach um, team of about 150 people. Those are 100% distributed and have always been 100% remote. So we had this odd paradox of the company of some people being at the company all the time and then some people being uh, distributed 100% of the time from the beginning of their careers. Prior to that, I was at Headspace for a while where I got to work with Ravina. Um, I was there for two years and uh, prior to that have been at large companies like Yahoo and then smaller startups. Um, so thrilled to be here and share many of the things that we tried that weren't great and learn uh, some of the things that are working for other folks as well. 
I can go next. Yeah, so hey everybody, um, I'm Ravina. I am, like Renth here mentioned, I'm a product manager at Headspace, which is a meditation and mindfulness-based company in Santa Monica. Um, I specifically am on the monetization team, so that's your traditional kind of conversion from a product point of view, also growth, and then also um, later stage retention on our B2C side of the business. So right now, our entire company is working from home, so we're looking at somewhere between 260 to 280 people right now. Um, and as I'm sure you can imagine, and it's been really popular in the news as well, it's a really interesting time right now for those in the mental health space, um, specifically for meditation, et cetera. Um, so we can touch on that more later. Um, before I was at Headspace, I worked at Disney. So quite a, a big difference to what it, uh, it is working at a tech company. But over there, I was doing product marketing and acquisition on their mobile games. So think like Candy Crush, but with Disney characters, uh, which is surprisingly much more fun than it sounds like. Um, but I was really interested in product learning from PMs there, which were kind of like the first round of PMs that Disney ever introduced. So uh, an interesting journey, but yeah, here at Headspace and happy to be here. Cool. Uh, I can go next. So I'm John Dobrovolsky. I've been at Envision for about two years as uh, Vice President of Product. Um, I'm specifically over uh, our tooling and collaboration products. So this is super fun for me. Um, the, the team has been remote for over a decade, um, fully distributed, and it's 800 people. So deeply embedded in the culture, being fully remote, and it's really a core value of the company. Um, because of that, we obviously have talent from all over the place. And so every day you know, is an interesting experience whenever we see people with maybe a cat around their neck or you know, a kid walking through the, the background or something like that. And it's, uh, you know, that's that maybe new for a lot of folks, but if for us, it's just every day. Uh, so I'm super excited to kind of just share a lot of our best practices and what we've kind of infused into the culture to make this something that works really well for us. Uh, also share some of the, you know, the cons as well, uh, whenever it's um, trying to like get through some challenges and, and really trying to figure out how to get through that, given the fact that we are in this new context um, and, and the fact that it's just a big part of our culture. Uh, in addition to that, um, have been in product for about the last 10 years, and before that did design and development, uh, got into product management through being in those other functions and really seeing the opportunity that product managers get to be really early in ideation and then help to carry, uh, you know, the quality and uh, value to a customer all the way through the process. Um, so just super jealous of, of that experience whenever I was in design and development positions and tried to move upstream as much as possible. You know, things have changed a lot obviously and it's much more of a team sport now but um that's that's how i kind of found my way into product so super excited to be here and um, looking forward to the discussion cool uh, my name is luke thomas i'm the founder of friday uh, we're building tools to help create structure and process to the way that you communicate which is especially uh, important for distributed teams um, i've worked remotely for probably seven years or so for a few different companies early stage kind of more growth stage so I have this very weird history of kind of learning what works and what doesn't from a few different companies. Um, and so, yeah, what we ended up doing was just building tools to solve those key workplace pain. Um, so specifically, uh, yeah, we just offer a super customizable tool to run your daily standups, weekly updates, and any other type of routine communication that involve, typically involves, you know, manually cobbling together processes. So um, I've worked remotely for a while. I'm a big fan of it. Um, would love to share some stories and what we see with our customer base as well as, you know, personal experience as well. Uh, before that, I ran product at this company called Crystal. I was based in Nashville and I am based here in Portland, Maine. So that's my story. Awesome. Uh, one thing before we get into the questions that we have for our panelists. So in Zoom, there's the feature where you can either raise your hand or submit something to Q&A. So after we do our first round of questions with the panelists, um, we're going to be opening up Q&A to you all. So if you have questions, uh, at that point, we'll have you raise your hand and we'll start picking from people. And if you don't want to ask your uh, question in person, you're more than welcome to submit anything to Q&A and we'll try to get through a few of those at the end as well. Um, one question that I wanted, it seems like we have a split run here and Ravina, you typically do product in person. Now you're making a shift. John and Luke, you've kind of been doing this uh, remote game for a while. So I, one thing I'm curious about is just general product principles that you all have kind of had pre prior to all of the stuff that's happening now, you know, regardless of work from home or remote or anything like that. 
Luke, how about we start with you? Do you mind repeating the question? Just general product principles, team principles you have, oh. regardless of before this event, um, but just things that you think about, and then we'll start to get into some of the remote and funkiness that we're in right now. Yeah, sure. So the biggest thing that I really try to uh, pay a lot of attention to and really build into our product development process is really being as close to the customer as you can, right? And tactically speaking, you know, the, the way I think about it is, you know, a customer, one customer, one user will, you know, is an anecdote, right? But if you hear it more than once, you, you can easily kind of start building some trends. Um, and it's your job to kind of sift through that noise and those anecdotes and kind of create this narrative or this story around like how you need to improve the product or deliver more value to the customer. Um, and one way you go about doing that, I would argue is, um, you know, it's easy to like send emails right back and forth. Um, but the, the closer you get specifically like getting on a phone call or getting on a zoom call or having them drive and, and like click buttons, um, has a huge impact um, and gives you that rich data that you need to be able to make better decisions. And so for me, uh, probably the most important thing that I really try to harp on with the team is like just getting involved and like being willing to jump on a call, being willing to, to have that rich discussion. And there's a point, there's a purpose for email, like it's fine, but if you can jump, like if you can go directly to the source, like that is a gift and you should really take advantage of that because it's easy to make decisions when you know you stare at metrics or um, you know what other people inside the company have to say. Um, but it's much easier to prioritize and to build a really interesting product or ideally a really interesting product if you let the customer drive. So that's probably the biggest product principle from my perspective. That I, to me, that's the most important thing because you're just building something for someone, right? And that's, that's the key. Um, so I, I just focus all I put all my eggs in that basket. I would just, you know, add on to that as well. Yeah, definitely being as close to the user as possible. And then, you know, I think there's this underscore principle of eliminating the biases that you think you have. I think oftentimes we can fall into a rut of assuming that we're building for us or or thinking that we maybe are the actual end user. And sometimes we may be, and sometimes we aren't. Um, so I think making sure that you're kind of as close to your user as possible, whether that's relying on your design research or user research team, your CX team to provide that insight, maybe you're on the ground and doing those studies yourself. I think it's hugely important. And then, you know, specifically on, on monetization and conversion, we do have to make sure we're making as many data-driven decisions as possible. So it's really ensuring that we're, we're balancing and marrying voice of the user with, okay, ultimately what are our metrics saying and what are our numbers saying and kind of straddling that line a little bit. In, in Envision, one of the things that I think is really interesting is, you know, if, if you're fully remote uh, or fully distributed as we kind of talk about it, um, you know, being a PM communication is such an important part of the job and uh, that can't be any harder than whenever you're all fully distributed. The only harder job, I think, is honestly being a product leader because then you have to have deep details and you have to be able to kind of communicate across the board while driving as much autonomy and knowing that people are kind of on in within the guardrails. And so communication is something that I, I always felt like I had pretty well figured out and I had really invested in over time. And then I came to Envision and I was like, oh my God, I have so long, I have so much harder than I thought to like really punch through and get the information out there. And so the things that we really focus on are Number one, making sure that we have the right artifacts throughout the product process. So ensuring that we have great product briefs that are super clear, easy to find, you know, worked on by the entire team, not just solely one person in a vacuum. Um, really making sure that we have the right channels set up in Slack to make sure that as the project evolves, that we have the right places to raise issues to leadership, to ensure that we have the right kind of cross-functional partners in all the right channels. And then through the process, one of the things that we've done that I've really loved is we have these, these two really important Slack channels, uh, product backstage and product TV. 
product backstage is where we actually record videos of us demoing like pre-release software or pulling together recordings of Zoom calls with customers, um, really kind of speaking to the narrative of the work that we're doing, showing data, showing the experiments that worked, the ones that didn't work, to really give our sales team and our product marketers like a lot of material to build a pull from, but also to help build trust and alignment within the business. Uh, in addition to that, Product TV being one we're really demoing for the support team to say, here's a product that came out, here's how it works. And now we have, we can go back quarter over quarter, month over month, week over week, and actually see everything that we've done. And it's been really nicely packaged so that uh, we can kind of see all that coming back and forth. One of the other things we do is we record most of our Zoom meetings, just like this meeting's being recorded. And one of my favorite things in the world is not going to a meeting and instead watching it on double speed. And um, my favorite thing beyond that is asking someone if I should even watch the recording in the first place. And the answer half the time is no. So efficiency is like a massive gain whenever you have this context. And it's not weird to record a meeting as it is necessarily if everyone's in person. Uh, and so that makes a massive difference for us. There was this one time recently where I was recalling a meeting that I was in uh, and someone mentioned to me that it was six months before I started. And I had not, I'd forgotten that I actually watched the recording versus having actually been in the meeting because it was just burned in my brain as a place that I was. So I had perfect understanding of these decisions that were made before I even worked at the company because we'd well documented the, the meeting and the review. Awesome. Thank you all for that additional context. It's really interesting to see how all, all of your companies and teams kind of operate. Um, so Luke and Ravina, you both mentioned that voice of the customer is, you know, one of the most primary principles, and I'm sure all PMs can kind of speak to that, that being able to understand the customer is one of the most important things. But now, since there's so much, you know, turmoil and instability happening in all of the lives of your customers and all of your users, how do you kind of adapt and think about that and, you know, build that into your product process and strategy moving forward? So it's, it's really interesting right now uh, with everything happening, um, being in the middle of a global pandemic has definitely been, I think, um, eye-opening for everyone at Headspace, just given the, the context of which we work in. Um, I think we've always been quite plugged into our users, but there's a different level now. It's, it's less of a micro individual user level and more of the macro feeling and sentiment that's going around not just, I mean, we're a global product, but obviously we have our core markets, but now we're listening to everybody all over the world. And so our typical channels that we normally have with our CX team or with our product marketing leads, they still exist, but we're, it's now just being amplified by our PR teams, by our founders, by our executives who are being asked to speak about mental health right now in, in other ways and how Headspace is contributing to that issue. Um, so it's, it's a blessing. We get so much of these inputs, but I also think we have to balance that with, okay, still, what is our end user need? And in, are we building for what our users need today? Are we building for what they will need in six months or what they'll need in 18 months? And obviously there's so much uncertainty. Like I can't have, give you a straight answer to that today, but I think uh, those additional channels are certainly playing a part in like defining what that product vision might be in the short term for sure. For me, uh, so a little bit of context, Friday is not a huge company. Um, we're still a pretty early stage uh, startup. And I mean, we've seen a huge influx uh, of people that you know, are new to remote and you know, their life is turned upside down in many ways. And so you know, as a small company and as the founder of the company, there's only a few things, like there's a few obvious things that I try to do. The first is to be really responsive. Right. So you have people that are like trying to get set up and, and running with your software and maybe they run into a bug. It's like, get back to them as fast as, as we can, right? Because that could be the difference between a really terrible day working from home or not, right? Um, so that's part one. Part two is, um, I treat this kind of part customer development, but I try to be super willing to get on the phone with people, even if, you know, I don't know if they're going to even use the tool or not. Um, and so specifically, I try to just be a resource um, and so, hey, you're new to remote. I've been doing this for a while. Here are some things that I would recommend you could do like now. Some of th that can be done with the software. Some of it is uh, just like something they could do on their own. And so for me, like just trying to be a sounding board and helping where applicable 
I mean, those are the only things that we're doing. And we're also just trying to ship code as fast as we can to solve more pain points. I mean, that's really, uh, from my perspective, that's the, those are the things that we're do, trying to do to help. Yeah, and I'll actually call out uh, Friday. Luke and I were talking about this before, but um, the product team I'm on, we actually use the Friday app and we started using it when we were co-located with our head of design um, being the only one who was remote. And everyone was a little, especially given that we were in person, they were like, do we really need a remote like stand up tool? And we just didn't have any interaction like that before. Um, and everybody loves it now. And it's super helpful now that we all are remote. Um, but so I'll just shout out Luke and stuff they're building there. Um, Run here, I was curious from your perspective, digital health kind of having a pretty big boom. There's a lot of things in telemedicine. It's harder, you know, there's a lot of stuff just happening in health. And I'm curious, you know, just what you're seeing, what you're thinking about in all of that right now. Yep. Just for a little bit of context, so what Omara Health does, we sell into companies, so large employers, uh, typically 3,500 and higher number of employees, and to health plans like Aetna, Cigna, et cetera, uh, primarily for chronic conditions that can be treated with behavior change of diet, exercise, and mindfulness. So things like uh, prediabetes, diabetes, high cholesterol, um, mental health issues, so stress, anxiety, depression, those kind of issues, um, and diabetes. And a lot of our uh, revenue is tied to us having the person engage with the product, so engagement uh, numbers, as well as actually achieving outcomes. So reduction in uh, cholesterol numbers, reduction in A1C numbers, et cetera. And so now with this kind of global pandemic, uh, there are a couple of things that are happening, some good, some not. Uh, in terms of the not good, the activity levels have gone down. And especially as we are trying to get people to move more uh, to take care of their physical selves, suddenly this whole thing of shelter in place, stay at home, has really messed with that message, understandably. Uh, so we've seen those numbers go down by about 30 to 40% just activity numbers. Uh, on the plus side, because of shorter commutes and stuff, people are sleeping more. So that's good. And so there's some of these things that are, are happening. Certainly stress levels were already on the way up with this global pandemic. They've gone up a lot. I think uh, Praveen indicated that with Headspace, we certainly see that a lot with our customers as well, just pleading for our behavior health product uh, and just ways to help people calm, uh, calm themselves, go to a trusted source for medical information because there's so much information about COVID-19, what you should do, shouldn't do, how it's transmitted, symptoms, so many of those kind of things that they just want a trusted source that they can go to for information and feel better because right now all this noise is fairly stressful. So that's where our coaching uh, service really helps because it's not just something that's automated and available to you. It's something that you can really engage. You can engage with a real person and that has been hugely um, helpful and appreciated. Yeah, that's great. To follow up on that, both Rund here and Ravina, you build consumer products that relate to health, wellness, relay information, and you brought up trust. And I was curious, in a consumer product, what have you found to be ways to really build up trust? Because um, I think that's like a universally needed thing with all of our products. So there's been a few different approaches that we've taken at Headspace. I think... Um, for a while, we really leaned into the science angle. So we actually are very fortunate. We have a chief science officer. We have an entire science team dedicated to that. Run here is very familiar with that team. Um, and for a while, we were really leaning into what were the scientific claims that we could truly make, because we found that in all of our research, all of our user research, that is what differentiated us from other products. So at the time, maybe let's say three, four years ago, even compared to now, there weren't nearly as many meditation mindfulness products on the market. And so we had the advantage of that time to have been able to go through trials and actually say using Headspace could reduce your stress by 23% in 14 days, et cetera. Um, so making those types of um, statements and making it visible and linking to those articles, et cetera, are a really great way of building trust. I think where it can start to get tough is now there are so many more products on the market. It's incredibly saturated. And frankly, it's not the barrier to entry is much lower. And it's not actually that hard to be able to go and run your own trials, surprisingly, and say, hey, our product, product, you know, Headspace 2.0 can do the same thing. Um, I think where it gets tough is we're in an age or in the current climate, building trust with users 
is tough because I think a now more than ever, if you lose a customer's trust, you've lost them for good uh, because they're really leaning on you during an emotional time period. So for us, it's really about listening with empathy and then responding in an empathetic way, which sounds really cheesy, but there's ways that our, mar our marketing team has done really well about how we're positioning Headspace to say, we hear you, we understand that there's uncertainty. We're not trying to tell you that we can fix anything, um, but here's what we can do. And being very open and honest about what those value propositions are, I think allows a user to say, I have X amount of information in front of me, Headspace is offering me why, let them come to their own conclusion, um, but really making sure that you're not over promising or overselling anything, I think is, is really key, especially right now. Yeah, I'll just, I'll start with saying that we know the three things that don't work in healthcare, fear, facts, and force. And we know that mainly because we've tried, you know, people have tried that all the time. Like you can tell people uh, what the facts are. You can make them fearful about their genetic predisposition to certain things. And some of those are pretty dire. Um, and you can try and force them to do it and sometimes even give them extrinsic rewards, like saying your insurance will go down by X if you do this. And those don't result in lasting change. So then the question is, what does? And what we found, trust is certainly a huge part of it. And one of the challenges we have as a B2B brand is that consumers, the employees, aren't as familiar with Omara Health as they might be with something like a Headspace or Calm or similar consumer application. And so we have to work extra hard for, for us to build trust with them. Uh, things that really help are having leaders of the company say, hey, we've used Omada or we've analyzed Omada against you know, X and Y and we've chosen to go with Omada and here's why. Uh, and then there are two parts. One is just getting them to interact with their coach and the coaches are amazing. They're very well qualified, but also screened and hired to have this level of empathy and trust. The other piece is we have very strong communities in the product itself around specific conditions, around the time of joining. So those are kind of their class cohorts uh, and around certain topics and their ability to be able to, to connect and share with people who are in a similar boat as them is really great. And the comments they tell us are, you know, I don't listen to my dietitian because he or she is not me. That person is so fit, they eat well, they're, you know, vegan, they're, they're all these things that are not me. And I just can't relate to them. I, I agree with what they're telling me, but I just don't have that level of empathy or trust. And that's what we are able to provide directly with our coaches. And more importantly, with that community is we're in this together. We are here for you. Uh, we succeed only when you succeed, and we are in it for lasting behavior change, not just the quick fix. That's great context. I think it's it's more important now more than ever to really build trust with your audience and with all of your customers. So it's really interesting to hear about all the different ways that you guys are going about approaching that. Uh, so we'll ask one more question, but it seems like we're coming up on seven o'clock here. So if any of you have any questions, feel free to start raising your hands and thinking of them, maybe submitting them to the Q&A if you have any. But the last question that I wanted to touch on was from, from everybody here, all the panelists, what are, you know, if you could give one piece of advice to everybody that's now working remotely with your teams, you know, what would you say that could potentially improve communication and collaboration for everybody that's working remotely now? I can start. Uh, I would say you really need to be super thoughtful about what communication channel you use um, and at what point you use it. So specifically, kind of I think uh, about things in terms of kind of two buckets. There's kind of ideation or like that heavy collaboration phase. Um, so for the Envision example, I believe it was like a project brief. Um, and so there's a lot of ambiguity. There's a lot of um, it can be very vague and the potential to be mis misunderstood is pretty high. Um, and so when that is the case, you should really strongly consider using like the richest communication channel you can, which as a distributed team, it's like a Zoom call, right? Because you can process body language, tone, emotion, um, and those extra data points. It's almost like uh, watching an HD movie versus something that is a little fuzzy. Um, it gives you the additional data you need to establish some sense of common ground. Um, on the flip side, there's kind of the iteration phase or kind of the, the, the time where you're just kind of sharing basic facts and knowledge, right? It could be like sharing metrics about a recent experiment, or it could be even in many scenarios, just quickly sharing like, hey, here's what I'm working on today. And FYI, I'm going to be out this afternoon because I need to go do something. 
in those specific examples, you should maybe think about using like a leaner communication channel, right? Post it on Slack, use a tool like Friday, write it down. Um, one thing I really, I, I say quite a bit these days is if it doesn't persist, it doesn't exist. And um, in the example of Envision, to get back to another example, um, the recording of those meetings, um, that like allows people to scrub through and to identify the part of the meeting that makes the most sense. It's asynchronous, you can do it anytime you want. Um, and that really can help serve uh, as kind of this foundation and help you become more aware of what's going on. So you don't have to have a meeting for everything, but you should strongly think about like which communication channel you use at what point in time. So if you're not on the same page, if you're struggling to go back and forth over Slack, swap the communication channel, jump on a Zoom call. Um, or in, in other scenarios where you're going around in a circle in a meeting sharing what you're working on, maybe you could have done that over text instead. Um, so that's my best piece of advice uh, because it's actually quite difficult to do. I would, I would love to plus one that like that. I wish everyone felt that way. And was, it really is to me, like I'll agree with you, like the deep intention in what you're looking to do is so much harder to get across because you don't get five at bats because you're grabbing coffee or getting lunch or whatever with someone or dropping by their desk. You have fewer opportunities for those small moments to really gauge someone's perspective. And when you're working really fast on a lot of uh, you know, high profile work or something that you know, people feel really passionate about, it's really easy to be misaligned and not realize it. And so I think like just operating with intention is, is super critical. The two things where I've kind of seen this recently was, you know, we had a person who recently came on in a leadership position in Envision. And she said to me, oh, well, you know, when I talk to X and Y people who will be reporting to me, I really want them to like walk away with X, Y, and Z. And I said, before you even have the conversation, prime it with that. Just say, hey, I'm new. Here's what I want you to walk away with, with this conversation. Then say all the things you were planning to say, and then ask them at the end, here's what I wanted you to feel. Did I actually achieve that? And it was one of those things that just, it feels a little bit awkward at first, but it really makes a massive difference. The other one, you know, we're in these constant alignment meetings to make sure that everyone's up to speed from a leadership perspective or on the ground with teams. And I was talking to a PM the other day who really struggled with a conversation that he was having to make sure that everyone was aligned. And he went back in and actually said, here are the principles that we've used to kind of solve this problem. First of all, um, not only are we as a team using these principles, but are we all aligned that these are the right principles? And it was really important for them to kind of set that up front and make sure that everyone in the meeting was thumbs up on, before we even get started talking about the thing that we're debating, are we correct in agreeing that we have the same principles? And then from there, let's make sure that we can structure this conversation effectively to get to the right outcome. And those types of small hacks, especially remote, make a massive difference. And this is the best time to kind of practice that stuff. So if and when the world turns back to quote unquote normal or you know, something changes, um, you're able to lean on some of that intention in person as well, which makes you even more powerful as a communicator and an aligner of the team. Definitely couldn't agree more with both of those points. I would say um, one way that we've actually tried to implement that, and we did this before we were all mandated to work from home and people thought we were crazy, but now we're seeing more people doing this is we ask every single person who sends a meeting invite our way to actually set a goal for the meeting. And we differentiate that it's not an agenda, which is just talking points. The goal is of all the participants in the room, what is that you're trying to get out of this meeting? And we've actually found the number of meetings have gone down because it forces the person who's setting up the meeting to evaluate, are these the right people? Is there another way I can accomplish this? More often than not, you probably can accomplish it in a more efficient way of communication. Um, and especially now more than ever, people are getting back-to-back -back meetings. It's tough when you're working from home to actually sort of set those boundaries. So we do ask everyone to do that. And I do think it helps with creating those boundaries and efficiencies. I would also say on a, on a tactical level, it's you know understanding your team's working style. Um, we, uh, on our monetization team, had a doc that we created. It was kind of like a team bonding moment um, when a new person joins the team and we go over more like, you know, casual things like, okay, when are you most productive? What's your communication preference? Um, when do we know that you're really heads down and we shouldn't bother you? But we've actually resurfaced that now more than ever to understand, okay, realistically, I have a team of 14 people. I can't adapt to every single person's working style. But at the same time, I don't want to make the assumption that everybody wants to do 
Zoom meetings all the time, or maybe they do want to do more in-person communication, et cetera. So I think it's understanding, like for instance, our product team runs quite differently than a lot of the other product teams at Headspace, where uh, myself and the other PM are quite extroverted and everyone else is quite introverted. And so it's understanding what is it your team actually wants and what is it that they're missing right now? And, and we uh, ask for a lot of feedback on our team. So what we heard from our team was, we just want to know what is going on everywhere else across the company. And so we have different solutions in mind, all hands, updates, et cetera, of how we can tackle that. But it's good to know that so we're not just bombarding them with what we think is the, is the answer. So I think really digging into what works for your team right now may not have worked for them you know, a month ago. Yeah, I'll just add a couple of specific suggestions. I think for, for our team, we've uh, realized that the default mode of communication is now written communication for obvious reasons. Uh, sometimes the time zone is uh, causes async, just the fact that you can't look around and see who's at their desk and available forces async. And so the, the art of written communication becomes even more important. My suggestion to the team has been to just uh, be really intentional about what you're writing. Uh, don't just write something and dash it off like a text message. Like really think about it, especially like John was talking about product briefs, those kind of things are really important documents. And if people aren't on the same page there, you just have second and third order consequences that are gonna be much harder to unravel. So the suggestion being write something, be as specific as possible, let it bake, come back, reread it, and then send it off. So don't, you, it's a lot better to be intentional and invest the time upfront or get somebody else to take a look at it before you send it out to the whole group. Um, another uh, suggestion that I'd incorporated before we did this is writing a user guide for myself. I think John, you alluded to that uh, as well, but it's basically writing, you know, what is it like to work with me? I, I may tend to send emails late at night, uh, whatever the, the intricacies and all of us have them and people are gonna discover them. So it's not like you're revealing any secret, you're just uh, accelerating the learning curve. And especially if you can get people who have already worked with you in past lives to uh, help write that for you, or at least edit it for you, that's super useful in just, uh, increasing or accelerating that learning curve and helping, as Ravina said, to understand what works for people. The third and final suggestion that we found really useful was we've made, uh, we've now made Zoom mandatory because that's the only way you can do synchronous communication in a 100% distributed world. And so the moment you hit uh, make a Zoom, uh, make it a Zoom meeting, it automatically creates this template in Google Calendar of who is the meeting owner, what's the meeting purpose, etc. And then for every item on the agenda, we have to declare whether that uh, point is to inform, to decide, or to consult. So even down at that item level, it makes it really clear to everyone in the room, what are we asking for? What's the point of that item on the agenda? And we've given all attendees the right and actually the expectation to say, if this thing is not clear, or it's clear that you shouldn't be there, decline the meeting. And so initially when we rolled that out, there were a lot of meeting organizers who were pissed that a whole bunch of people just declined their meetings because they hadn't done their homework, which was exactly the message. So there are ways that you can help uh, use this kind of silver lining in this cloud to actually run uh, fewer meetings and run them better because time is really scarce. Uh, somebody said, you know, if somebody would have just come by your desk and grabbed things off your desk and walk off, you'd be like, hey, what are you doing? That's inappropriate. And yet for something far more valuable, which is our time, we don't fight as hard. And we should. Uh, th these were all really good. And I think one thing I'm seeing is a quick trend on this is intentionality among teams, not just product teams, but intentionality among some of these teams is a key lever of success, whether it's remote or not. Um, so we have a couple people with their hand raised. So we'll kick it off with Sua. I think Jenny will unmute people. There we go. Great. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Sua, I'm on the investment team at Underscore VC. So thank you everyone for joining today. It's been such a great panel uh, so far. Uh, I previously came from the product world, so can empathize with a lot of these issues, uh, most recently at Devoted Health and at CVS Health's Digital Innovation Lab. So a question that I have is, uh, around some of the themes that came up today is around organizational alignment, but with a laser focus around the voice of customer. So to that end, are there any tools and tips uh, that you have around staying in sync uh, around the voice of the customer and particularly with the sales and customer success teams? Because 
they each come with their own perspectives and a lot of anecdotes that they bring, but being data driven to drive decisions and really synthesizing all of their perspectives is at the crux of the product team's job. So any advice or tips around that I think would be helpful for folks on the call. I'll quickly mention a few quick things and then I'll pass it off. Um, the things that I've seen work really well is getting on the phone call uh, with a salesperson and listening and asking questions periodically. That, that goes a long way. It really speaks volumes to someone in sales in particular. Um, I would strongly recommend doing that on a regular basis. The second is uh, at a previous company, we did uh, a weekly, gosh, what was it called? It was called, uh, it was essentially a weekly update in which uh, our customer support team would share at a high level, like the frequent bugs, the things that they heard on a regular basis, and that was shared with everybody. That worked really, really well. And then, uh, gosh, there's one other thing I was thinking about. Um, I forget it, so I'll just pass it off. <laughs> for, for me, um, one of the things that was most important, especially to, to the point of sales team who's bringing back data, uh, was to make sure that the team understood where to funnel that data to be most effective. So to Luke's point, um, we, we have it set up so that we actually get support uh, information back, like feature requests or bugs, and we actually match that to annual recurring revenue that gets tied to those requests. And we make sure that whenever we have a customer rep of any kind having a conversation with a customer, that any of those requests come through and they get bucketed through support as well. So that support can make sure they're collating them appropriately and we can actually see that come back in the data as well, um, which is really helpful for us to make sure that we're getting back to everybody whenever we launch a feature or take care of an issue or solve a problem that knocks out like 100 feet, like feature requests at the same time. The, um, the thing that's really important, though, is not just that that's one of our uh, like pipelines of data, but also um, we have a, a, like a standard kind of training salesware uh, that exists within the company. And we made sure to enter um, specific training around how we as a product team prioritize. So one of the biggest questions we get is, hey, I'm, I'm a salesperson. I'm hearing this from a customer. I feel like I'm throwing this thing into a black hole how are you guys prioritizing? And so what we really did, we, we made a video that was really clear and very explicit about all of the different data inputs that we've got, how we're making decisions, why we're making decisions that way. The fact that it's not just our whim, right? But, uh, you know, it's a really multi, it's a like deep multifaceted kind of rubric that we utilize to make these decisions and then how they can get involved and where we want to see their feedback to make sure that we're on the right track and ensuring that we have both, you know, surveys that occur at a quarterly basis that we actually review and then come back with actions and reflect back in our conversation whenever we talk about what's happening behind the scenes or what's happening when we launch a product. But also in addition to that, making sure that we have like a great buddy system with uh, sales and support across the PM group and the rest of the, the trios in our squads. And then also that we're doing AMAs with leadership. So Q and A's just like this one with product leaders and the rest of the teams to ensure they all feel like they're actually involved and they get to actually raise issues directly to the folks that they know are informing the teams on what it is that their priorities are. Rund here, Ravina, anything you wanna add on that? Cool. Um, all right, we have a few questions in the Q&A bucket I can, I can kind of bring up. Um, one from Joe is, what tools, if any, are you using to have discussions asynchron asynchronously outside of calls? I'm finding that having a bunch of Slack threads and channels can be difficult to keep track of. Yeah, I can definitely agree with that. Uh, that's definitely chaotic. Uh, one of the things we've adopted is using Google Docs, and we just standardize on that. Uh, and the two specific elements within Google Docs that we use, one is uh, the suggestion suggestions mode, and then the other is comments. And that way, at least all the conversations are kept in context. Uh, it does tend to get messy sometimes, so we definitely do a couple of reviews and, and then make sure that it's ready to get progress to the next level. But at least uh, the conversations are contained with context and uh, Q&A, and things can get resolved there before it gets promoted as the delivered version. So we certainly find that things may get triggered in Slack or email or other places, but if there's anything of permanence going to happen, that it happens in a Google Doc.
Yeah, I mean, I, I would just add on, it's something that we're definitely struggling with right now. And I think it's overwhelming. It's to the point now where we actually um, try to make sure everyone has dedicated time away from Slack and email. So a couple hours a day just to do heads down work. I know that you can ask everyone to kind of police their own schedules, but I think if you can empower them as a product leader to say, feel free, like put it in your Slack status from you know 10 to 11, I am heads down. I appreciate that. Uh, and I know they appreciate that as well. We also do, um, we finally brought back what we call no meeting Thursdays, which our entire uh, engineering and product orgs have tried really hard to abide by. It can get a little tough because of course we have other teams that we interface with, marketing, et cetera, and they don't have those same, the luxury of being able to kind of block off their calendars like we do. But um, we found that trying to minimize the number of meetings, et cetera, actually also seems to help decrease the number of slacks that come in and, and emails. I, I think what we found in the beginning when we were trying to adjust in the first couple of weeks was we were over communicating. And I think everything that you read right now about working from home is you should over communicate. And I, I totally agree, but it was almost to the point of, okay, too much FYI, like, that's great. I don't need to know. It's almost like, I'm not sure I got to start filtering things out. And so once we start cutting down on meetings, I think it, it forces people to reflect on, am I sending intentional communication? Like we've kind of been talking about. And so it, it was kind of a nice domino effect for us as well. I think uh, to the Google Docs point, the one the one document type that I've found that's really helpful here is uh, Dropbox Paper. There's a couple of extra features uh, outside of Google Docs that, that are really helpful. I think the suggest mode in Google is really great. Uh, when it comes to Dropbox Paper, the two things that I really love are this like attribution that occurs when you type. So you can actually see who it is that's written something, which I feel like when you're working asynchronously, it's super helpful. You can also see obviously whenever an avatar pops in who's been in the document. So when you send something to somebody, they can say they read it, but if they're not there, they never read it, right? And then the third being document updates, which products like Confluence have kind of done for a long time, but done very poorly in my opinion. Um, the experience of actually just seeing the updates and changes to a document without having to visit it again, or to have someone send it back to you, makes a big difference in just getting that kind of passive communication back or um, you know, just getting an update on, on what exactly has changed. I think in addition to that, like using tools like Google Docs or a paper um, to, to craft communication as an alignment tool, uh, it doesn't actually have to be like a document as the end state. There are a lot of times where I'm with my trio of leads and we're trying to just get a communication back to the team and we'll immediately throw it into a Google Doc, not because we even always are going to communicate it exactly the same way, but just as a way to force the fact that we need to be aligned against communication. So instead of having this conversation over Slack, um, a lot of times what we'll do is just immediately move it into a Word doc so we can start to actually collaborate on communication together as opposed to kind of debating points and then trying to cobble it together later. There's this really good quote. I, I saw it online somewhere and uh, the author said something along the lines of writing is thinking. And, um, and that's certainly true. Like r when you write things down, it allows you to revise. Uh, unlike a real time meeting, there is a revision process that happens naturally. Um, and so if you are struggling to collaborate, the writing process can serve as a really useful foundation for the collaboration that ensues forces you to be more thoughtful. It forces you to create some structure to the way that you're thinking. And as a result, typically you end up having a better conversation. So I think of it like there's like this yin yang relationship between real time and asynchronous. And so if you can balance both of those um, and use them in tandem, you, it, in many ways it kind of creates like this little superpower of sorts. Um, so yeah, that's, that's certainly what I've seen. One other quick note on the Slack kind of chatter in, in specifically. There's a lot of chatter that happens in Slack because people feel like they don't like know what's going on. So they kind of like, people frequently kind of dance around what they're actually trying to get to, right? It's like, it, no one wants to just ping a coworker and say, what are you working on? <laughs> like, so what I have done in the past, uh, you, you kind of like, you, you bounce around a little bit and you're like, hey, how is this? How's that? Oh yeah, like, how is this thing going? And like a ton of chatter is just a function of like you not being direct. And so maybe like consider being direct or, um, you know, just implement some type of communication habit 
um, that enables the regular flow of information. So for us, and like you don't need to use Friday to do this, you can do it in Slack anyway. Um, we do a Monday morning priorities and it, uh, we essentially have two things that we share. One is, hey, how was your weekend? And B, what are your priorities for this week? Um, Tuesday through Friday, we do a daily standup in which unlike most standups, um, you know, yesterday, today blockers, we share what are you working on today and what else is going on? Um, and if there is a blocker, we can have a meeting about it if we need to. But if it's just information sharing, we don't have to. And then on Friday, I, with all my direct reports, do a kind of team leader-like check-in where I ask them, hey, like, how did you feel this week? Um, what are you like super stoked about? What are you excited about working on next week? And that is only viewed by me versus the others, which are viewed by everybody. And that serves as a really helpful foundation for one-on-one -on -one meetings. And because people are behind a screen, they tend to be more honest and they write and they give you this really useful foundation for those real-time one-on-one meetings. And so that's how we kind of have, have architected our communication. And as a result, we just don't have as much Slack chatter because we kind of already know what's going on. Awesome. I think we have time for about two questions. So we'll go with um, Adam Bechtel live and then we'll do one more from Q&A. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah, it looks like I'm there. Cool. Uh, my name is Adam and I'm a product manager at Cosmos, a product strategy and product development firm here in Boston. Um, a few of you have talked about best practices and tips and tricks. Um, John, you had this concept of artifacts in the product process which sounds relatively formal and might be shared as like a standard across the whole company. Uh, Ravina, you mentioned letting teams have the freedom to work differently. How do you guys think about choosing which practices are really best practices and which are up to teams individually? And then once you have those best practices, how do you share them and make them part of your process? Um, I can just quickly add in thoughts here. We do a lot of uh, so cheesy testing and trial and error on our side. So uh, what we started with was we we had a team, the actual um, core monetization team at Headspace has changed quite a bit. And so we knew we wouldn't be able to adapt as quickly to the individual working styles as we would have with the team that we had had for a little bit longer that was more established. So in the beginning, it was the PMs kind of coming up with, okay, we're gonna try something, here's style A, we'll try it. And then we really are big on feedback. We do a lot of one-on-ones and like anonymous polls. And I'm sure our team gets really irritated with all the feedback we ask for, but it's really helpful because uh, we use that to kind of create our first sort of set of monetization principles and what it's like to join the team and work on this team, which was really important because we operate very differently than a lot of other product teams at Headspace. Then, um, I would say in the last seven to eight months, our team became really established and we have the same core group of around 11 people. And so for us, it was um, really uh, kind of almost going back to like ground zero and asking everybody, okay, kind of fill in the blank. Like wh what are your thoughts around uh, all of these different things? And we kind of put it together and we went through it as a team and it was important for us to do that so we could, uh, you know, I think there's a lot to be said about like the body language and the nuance of people's reactions live in the room. So it was like a two hour meeting. It was long, but ultimately what we got out of that meeting is what we still are using right now, you know, in April 2019 um, to kind of inform how we work. So it, I don't have a perfect answer. It was just a lot of testing and seeing what worked and what didn't work and hoping that your team is really honest with you about what is working. Um, at Envision, we were, uh, three years ago, we were about 220 people and now we're 800. And so we've scaled like totally, it's been crazy. The last year we've actually tried to drive more efficiency in that scale, um, but through that process, uh, a lot obviously changed. We doubled the product management team, we turned over some folks, uh, we increased a lot of the best practice and focus there. And so I love this question, Adam, because it's it's exactly what our job is as product leaders, especially to basically norm teams and find the opportunities uh, and then really kind of like present them to everyone else. And so what we did really was most important for us then was to make sure that everyone kind of had the same operating playbook. Everyone's coming from everywhere. Everyone has the way that they do things. And so it's really important to make sure roles and responsibilities are clear, all those types of exercises. Um, and we did that by just doing kind of a PM 101 training where we did just an hour of content over every week for a number of months. 
which just about killed me personally trying to put all that together. But uh, it was super helpful, I think, for the teams to kind of talk through like the artifacts that we had, and how we were like applying these practices. But as leaders, like the, the best opportunity that I've found to, to really make a big impact is to find someone who's done something within their, their squad or team and to really see the impact of that and then represent that best practice or that template or that methodology and then give the case study to the team to say, here's how I've seen this be successful. Maybe give this a try. And when you see that work two or three times, you know that you've got a hit on your hands. And it's really, the way that I think about it is a, a you know, a media product is really, my product is the team, which means that I need to be launching features all the time. I need to be sunsetting features all the time. And you know, that PM 101 was the hottest thing for the like four months and then it became persona non grata after that and people were just totally sick of it and so you have to always be kind of finding these new things to excite the team and you can understand like your general goals uh, but finding ways into those goals so it feels like we're making really great progress and really refining and maturing the team is critical and the place that comes from is all the pms and whenever pms start to see that their best practice or their methodology is being utilized by other people it gives them an opportunity to drive change business, which leads them to new leadership opportunities, but it also creates this great gamesmanship for people to say, oh, you know, I found this interesting hack. Let me go share it with everyone because maybe other people will use it and I'll get this really great feeling that I've made a difference at the company. And so just creating that environment within the business that you're in uh, makes a massive difference. And personally, when I work with colleagues who, who do this type of work, that's the most rewarding and the most fun that I have is whenever I'm working with folks to really optimize the process and to find those, pla those places that we just completely ignored that we have massive gains in just morale or um, efficiency or delivery for our customers. Cool, we have one more Q&A, but one thing I know Rendir said he has to has to drop. So I wanna give a, a big thank you to Rendir for joining us in the middle of his day. And um, he already answered the, the question in Q&A that I wanna ask you all. So uh, we'll, we'll go straight to that question. So for those of you from co-located to remote product management, did you have a bias toward co-located product management before all this? If so, do you still have that bias? Um, and Luke, I know you've worked remote for a while, so maybe you can kind of give the op opposite perspective of uh, bias and how you changed there, but I think that, that will be a great note to end on. Maybe we can get started with you, Luke, yeah. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Uh, there is no replacement for meeting in person. Clearly, we can't do it right now. Um, but I cherish the time that I can like fly down to Nashville and hang out with people in my team. Um, it is a, definitely a source of like a lot of ideation and and like a lot of it ends up being product development related. And so, you know, as someone who is a big fan of remote and for a variety of reasons, there is absolutely value in meeting up in person. Most of the fully distributed companies do it at least twice a year. Um, and yeah, I mean, it allows you to accelerate relationship building, trust and other things. And like, that's kind of the bedrock of the product development process. So, you know, I think the one thing I would just advocate for as someone who is, would, you know, I'm a, I'm a remote guy is that um, it's not an all or nothing proposition. It's just being very thoughtful about when you play certain cards, right? It's like, hey, I need to, you know, probably meet up with my team a couple times a year. And while we are there, it's not only about the work. In fact, it's probably not about the work. It's about getting to know each other in person and maybe talking strategy, for example. Um, so I would just, I think how I think about it is, um, you know, people will gravitate towards different preferences. I certainly am a fan of remote largely because I'm able to work so, with some really great people. Um, and, and that greases the wheels for the product development process. Uh, but it's, all, it's not an all or nothing proposition. Um, at least uh, when life is normal. <laughs> John or Ravina, do you guys swing one way or the other? Has this convinced you at so, all? I, I think it's just, a, it's a total double-edged sword. You know, there's pros and cons for each. I think that really just being, you know, um, like, like we've said before, committed and intentional is the most important thing. I agree with Luke, like we, we get together two or three times and I found excuses for teams to do like co-development uh, with a customer and get it paid for by sales instead of product to, uh, to kind of get in person and spend some more of that, that quality time together. The thing that I love about it is we get the PMs together twice a year 
and it goes till two in the morning. And if you walk in, it's a it's a debate on strategy. It's everyone's stone sober <laughs> and like debating strategy until two in the morning. And it's fun and we're super passionate about it. Uh, so it really does count for a lot whenever we're in person. And I think we make the most of that time when we do it. I think the important thing about making it work whenever you're fully distributed uh, is something that you know, recently happened to me where I was talking to uh, the founder and a bunch of the senior leadership and we had this problem. It was a really gnarly problem. I was like, oh man, this is the one where we just like get a bunch of people into a room, fly them from all over, spend the money and just get it done. And I was like, ah, oh, it's me being a leader. And he was like, nah, I don't think so. And I was like, oh, it's okay. And he was like, you know, the reason why we do this is to make sure that we can always do this. And so if we have to get in a room to figure something out, then we're going to wait and get in a room every time we have a hard problem. And so we need to work through this and we need to figure out how to do that because we're a fully distributed company. And I, I, uh, I had like a deep respect for that moment because it was really clear culturally what was important to us. And it was really interesting because he could have said, yeah, 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 just do it and get it out of my face and like go figure it out. You know, but it was really difficult to make sure that we got it done right. But then we had this great muscle to be able to do that afterward whenever we saw a problem similar to that. So I think it's, it's really just understanding your context and ensuring that you, you know, fully invest in that and then take the best to, to Luke's point of, of both worlds, right? Like if I worked at a company that was not fully distributed and co-located, I'd still be recording meetings. I was the weirdo that was doing that whenever we were all in the same room. So I think that there's just, there's a lot you can take away from this experience uh, to kind of bring back if you don't continue on this way. Uh, and uh, I just encourage you to kind of make sure, make, make those mental notes and really understand what those things are so that you can really like just strengthen all of the processes and, and kind of your way of operating. I'll just add on super quick to round out, but look, I mean, there's pros and cons of both. You've both said it well. I don't have a three hour commute anymore and crazy LA traffic. I really can't complain there. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of natural organic conversation that happens in the office at various points of the day. I think what this has really shown, um, not just Headspace, but other companies as well, hopefully is to eliminate some of the preconceived notions or biases that people may have had around working from home. Um, Headspace is a little bit um, better. When I was at Disney, the issue of optics was really strong. And if you weren't at the office, you weren't working. And my partner is an attorney that's very much so very real in that space. So I'm hoping that this sort of force mandated period allows people to say, actually, you can be incredibly productive. And for some people, even more productive when you are working from home. So it always goes back to like, what works best for each individual? And hopefully we can understand here, there isn't one solution fits all. Maybe we can have a little bit more of a flexible sort of, uh, you know, working style moving forward. Uh, this was really, really great. i um, happy we got to, to hear from all of you, Ravina, Luke, and John. Um, and honestly, I didn't know any of you in person before this event, and you all somehow volunteered and got roped into this. So thank you again. Um, thank you to Ileana for texting me and saying, hey, what are we going to do? Let's get an event around this. And then thank you to the entire underscore team, Jenny, Sua, Christina, Devin, who kind of helped pull all of this together. Um, for those of you that are in Boston, you know, and we try to continue to build out this um, underscore product core and this community, um, let us know how we can help, especially now. I think we've seen a lot of really positive response in terms of community. And I think community is really interesting to do virtually, but we should do it and we should figure it out and um, reach out to Jenny and I anytime with ideas or requests or questions. And I think Ileana is going to work on a little recap article with some highlights from what people had. So if any, anybody from the community wants to add to that, um, just let us know. But thank you again for everybody for, for the participation and help. Thank you. Thank you. All right. See you, everyone. Have a good night.